Um, um, and then we're going to go forward with the um, Black, Black History Month celebration. I do need to have a motion to ratify the actions taken in closed session. So moved. So moved. Second. And discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I have it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Parks and Recreation. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, Darren Conforti, uh, Acting Director for the Record. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, it's nice to be back down here in Chambers. Um, coming this Monday, of course, the nation's going to celebrate the 90th birthday of Martin Luther King, Jr. And then just a few short days after that, we're going to begin our month-long celebration of black history. And so we're here today to give you an overview of our uh, planned programs for uh, the Black History Month program uh, that we've got coming up this year. And I'd like to ask uh, Rosalind Johnson, our Deputy Director for Facility Operations, to come on up and introduce our team, who's going to give you all an overview. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Commissioners. For the record, Rosalind Johnson, Deputy Director of Facility Operations. And we have um, an exciting presentation for you today. Um, as you're aware, we don't celebrate just Black History Month. We celebrate black history all month long in Prince George's County. Um, but we especially like to highlight. Year long. I'm sorry, all year long. All year thank long. you. But we especially like to highlight Black History Month. Um, you may be wondering why we have the Natural and Historical Resources Division here to present to you. Um, we have have moved the program to NHRD. Um, previously, we did not have um, a d an assistant chief for history in NHRD, and we've since hired an amazing um, assistant chief in NHRD. And I will have Christine Fanning, who is the division chief for NHRD, introduce um, our new team. So that's the reason for the movement to Natural and Historical Resources Division, um, because they do have a concentrated effort on history, but they still do work closely with the Arts and Cultural Heritage Division. So we um, believe that you will see a little bit of um, enhanced attention to um, our black history program. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Chris Fanning. Good morning, good morning. Um, it is my absolute honor. Oh, for the record, this is Christine Fanning, um, Division Chief for Natural and Historic Resources, Parks and Recreation, Prince George's County. Um, it is my absolute honor to introduce you to Omar Eaton Martinez. Um, I know a few of you have already met him. I met him 10 years ago um, when we were bringing 500 young people to New York City to empower them to be stronger leaders. And it was clear now, as it is today, how passionate he is about engaging diverse communities in our country's most important issues. Um, his, under his portfolio, 13 sites, including five house museums, an aviation museum, archaeology, dinosaur park, and of course now black history. Um, and as, as Rosalind Johnson just said, you know, black history is not only um, during the month of February, obviously, it's year round, and we believe black history has a role to play not just in one division, but really departmental wide. And so that's our commitment to this, um, to black history, is making sure that it has the resources and support and strategic vision um, to take it to a new level. Um, Omar comes to us from the, National, the Smithsonian National Museum on American History. Prior to that, he was with the National Park Service. He taught K through 12 in New York City and in Washington, D.C. And so if anything, I think has prepared him for um, some of the challenges ahead of us. Um, I think that might be it. He's currently pursuing a Ph.D. at the University of Maryland um, in American Studies with a specific focus on race and museums. Um, and I just think finally, in these um, uncertain times, I think it's more important than ever that we, uh, all of us, learn more about our history and our past, our full past, um, so that we can be more prepared to shape the future. Um, before I turn it over to Omar, I just want to really recognize and welcome and thank Dennis Dostert and his team. Um, you know, we've participated, our division has participated, of course, in black history um, over the years, but it, we had no idea <laughs> the amount of work dedication, um, stick to it infamous that, uh, that Dennis brings to his work. And so I've just been so impressed and inspired by him. So thank you, Dennis, and welcome aboard. And uh, Omar, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is an honor to be here. For the record, my name is Omar Eaton Martinez. I am the new Assistant Division Chief for Historical Resources 
for the National Historical Resources Division. Uh, I come to you uh, very humbled and very honored to present to you about Black History Month, but largely the Black History Program, which I'd like to reiterate is 12 months of the year. Um, we have, in the Black History Month, we have planned uh, an exhibition that hopefully you all will be able to come to the opening reception, uh, January 27th at Montpelier Art Center, dealing with uh, the history of black migration and immigration in Prince George's County. Uh, we also produce a poster, which will also be unveiled at that opening on that same date, as well as a calendar brochure, which some of you already have. Uh, we passed out uh, an earlier draft of that for you all to have and refer to and see the great many things that we do here at the commission to support black history. I just want to say as someone who is new to the commission, I was overwhelmed to know how deeply involved the entire commission is around black history. It is not just coming from historical sites, it's not just coming from art centers, but it's coming from the community centers and other parts of our commission as well. And as you'll see that, it's reflected there on the calendar brochure in front of you. Um, also, in addition to that, the Black History Program does manage three historical properties. It is Abraham Hall, uh, originally Rosenwald School, and Dorsey Chapel. And so all these things are part of the portfolio. They, have, they manage programming throughout the year about the black experience in Prince George's County and other black experiences that are in conversation with that, as well as the Black History Month and all the wonderful things that come with that as well. Without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our Black History Program Manager, Dr. Dennis Doster, Baltimore native, City High graduate. He earned his BA um, um, in history and in English from the Howard University. And he also earned his master's and PhD in history from the University of Maryland College Park. So without further ado, I'd like to have Dr. Dennis Doster come and do the presentation for you. I'll take my seat over there to advance the presentation slides. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners, Chair, Vice Chair, and Commissioners. Um, as for the record, Dennis Doster, I'm head of the MNC PPC Black History Program, and I, we have a brief presentation for you all just to give an overview of Black History Month and the uh, celebrations that will be ensuing in a few days. Um, so the next slide. Of course, uh, Black History Month every year, um, there is a national theme that is set by the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and so this year's theme is black migrations. And so I um, see on the next slide uh, an image that kind of goes along with that. It's an iconic image from a, a, a very important exhibit that was done in the late 80s by the National Museum of American History. Uh, but of course, our ex exhibition this year, the exhibition that's being curated by the MNC PPC Black History Program, also deals with this particular theme. So the next slide um, and the next one. Um, so moving out, moving in, moving up the story of migration and immigration in Prince George's County. The exhibition will be on view at the Montpelier Arts Center beginning January 27th until the end of February, February 28th. Um, next slide. Um, right, near, right there you'll see just the names of uh, the, the amazing team that we have that put together this exhibition. So we have, of course, I want to definitely highlight in her absence, Ms. Artura Jackson, who is the historian for the Black History Program. So my right hand and is very instrumental in helping to put together the exhibition. And then, of course, you have the rest of our team listed, Juanita Morikita, Gina Vaughn, Darren Meekle, Justin McAllister, and then, of course, myself. And then on the next slide... Um, we have our, our designers, so we have uh, Ms. Kathy Adario, who is our lead um, designer in our NHRD exhibit shop, and her team, which consists of Jennifer Crump, who are very instrumental in this exhibition as well. And then next, um, this is a team effort, of course, throughout the Department of Parks and Recreation. So the Maintenance and Development Division's carpentry shop and their exhibit shop are also uh, instrumental, and the staff at both Oxon Hill Manor and the Montpelier Arts Center are very uh, instrumental in putting together this exhibition for Black History Month. Uh, next. next one. And then you should have 
uh, in your hands a copy of the invitation for the opening reception. As Omar mentioned, that will be Sunday, uh, January 27th from 2 to 5 p.m. We have a great lineup. We have, um, in terms of our speakers, we'll have um, a state delegate, jo Jocelyn Pena Melnick, who is going to speak, and she's going to give reflections on migration from a personal perspective as a woman of African descent who uh, immigrated from the Dominican Republic to New York, then eventually migrated to Prince George's County and became a very involved in politics and, of course, is uh, one of um, our state delegates. And then also we'll have a historical reflection from um, right here in Prince George's County, Dr. Sharon Harley, who is a professor and former chair of the Department of African American Studies at the University of Maryland. So we have a great program uh, in store, and we hope to see each and every one of you all there. And then also was mentioned, we have uh, the reception will be the unveiling of our annual Black History Month poster. This year marks the 30th anniversary of that tradition. So 1989 was when we first started putting out Black History posters. And so this will be the 30th year that we've done that. Uh, next slide. So uh, the sli since 2016, this um, poster has been created through a new program we created called the Black History Program Visual Arts Summer Internship, where we have students come in during the summer prior to the February, and they learn about black history, they learn about um, arts, and we kind of bring that together it's for them to create this poster that is a much celebrated artistic piece in our community. Um, next slide. Those are just some images from our students, actually from two years ago when they were working on the um, poster as part of the internship. And then next, these are our students that worked this past summer for the artwork that you will see unveiled uh, uh, on January 27th. Mackenzie Dixon, Clarence Edwards, Ryan Mesidor, and Cameron Miner. They worked with a resident artist, uh, Nikki Levy. And then also we brought in a commission artist that came in and kind of put all of this work together and added his own piece to it, uh, celebrated local artist Curtis Woody. Um, as has been mentioned, we have um, programs all throughout Prince George's County put on by numerous uh, types of facilities, so from our arts facilities to our historic venues to our community centers, more than 75 events that are going on during the month. So right now I'm just going to highlight a few of those events, but you all have the full uh, brochure in front of you all that you can take your time when you have time to go through and, and look at all the great events that are happening. So next slide. Um, next slide. Next slide. So these first set of events are events that are actually being put on by the MNC PPC Black History Program. So our office is putting on our own set of events during Black History Month. And so just to highlight a few of those, uh, one, February 5th at 11 a.m., we're doing a book talk on a new book uh, on Josiah Henson that is actually being written by the uh, Montgomery Parks senior historian. So we're reaching to the other side of the commission and bringing them in for our Black History Month program. And then those last two programs you see listed on the 21st and the 28th, those are programs that go directly along with our exhibition. So we're having a panel discussion on black immigrants and local black immigrant communities on February 21st. And then on the 28th, we're part partnering with the uh, old Greenbelt Theater and doing a screening of the documentary What Happened to Chocolate City. So that documentary directly relates to our programming and looking at how gentrification is changing uh, this area and how that affects migration to Prince George's County. And then, of course, we have great activities throughout the Department of Parks and Recreation, as I've said, so we'll highlight a few here. So Afternoon Aviators, uh, which is a series that is done at the College Park Aviation Museum. They'll um, be teaching young people about George Carruthers and his spectrograph, so this astrophysicist, on February 2nd from 2 to 4. Um, next. Madre Africa, so uh, this uh, is a musical program exploring African heritage in Latin America, and it will be held at Public Playhouse, and so this is actually geared towards people of all ages. Taste the African American Experience, February 8th from 7 to 10 by, at the uh, Blatonsburg Community Center, and that particular event will, uh, will focus on the um, life of enslaved uh, chef James Hemings. So uh, talking about him and how he went to Paris with uh, his uh, masters, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and how he learned French cuisine and then brought that back to the United States. And so we'll be learning a lot about uh, his life, and actually they'll be engaging in actually cooking recipes from James Hemings. Uh, first, Do No Harm, so a, a program, a day-long program that's going to be looking at the history of African Americans in medicine with discussions and exhibits that we held at Prince George's Ballroom on February 9th from 11 to 3. 
honoring Emily Sa Saunders Plummer, so the matriarch of the Plummer family at Riversdale. So recently, Dr. Lee Ryan, who volunteers at, at Riversdale, uh, worked to get uh, Emily Saunders Plummer uh, nominated and selected for the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame. And so she's going to be talking about her life uh, in honor of that, that uh, very important recognition on February 10th. Uh, HBCU Experience Tour, so something uh, geared towards our young people, expo ex uh, exposing them to all the opportunities in higher education uh, that are available through HBCUs, which is from the Marlowe Heights Community Center. Uh, of course, we recently lost the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, so there will be a concert held at Newton White Mansion on February 21st, honoring um, her legacy and her great work. And then lastly, well, there will be a book discussion on a, you know, a very, very popular and important book out now, Becoming Michelle Obama, at, on February 28th at the uh, Southern Regional and Techno Technology and Recreation Complex. And this has all been put together, as has been mentioned before, this is a team effort. This is not just one person, not just one office. And so just to acknowledge the not only the Natural and Historical Resources Division, but also Arts and Cultural Heritage, our Public Affairs and Marketing Division, and our Maintenance and Development Division, and helping to bring all of these different elements together. One thing I will mention is that you should have with you a, a little giveaway that we will be giving out at, through Black History Month, which is a, a compass, which kind of very... Yeah, very appropriately speaks to the theme of migration and moving and finding your home and how Prince George's County has been a very important home for us in this community. And then lastly, as has been said, and I will reiterate again because it, it is my job to always remind people that we do black history not just during February but year round. And so we want to remind people to uh, come out and support and celebrate and honor this rich history 365 days of the year. And then lastly, it's just our, our information. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Martinez, we thank you very much and welcome aboard. We had some good events already since, you, since starting, um, Ms. Fanning and, and everyone else in the Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, and, and to all of you who are present today and in our viewing audience, we really invite you to participate. The programs are really phenomenal. When you hear about them, they capture your attention, but when you actually go and participate, they far exceed anything you could have ever imagined. So we wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that's it for you for now. Right? That's all we have, Chair Hewitt. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. So, A member of the uh, Association for the Study of African American Life and History, the organization responsible for the theme, to thank everyone in the department. Ross, and I know you're very familiar with the organization, and you too, Omar. Uh, but the work we do here at Prince George's County around that subject year-round is just absolutely amazing. And, and Dr. Duster, your, your energy, your knowledge, we are just fortunate. I don't think anybody else in the country has anybody like you. And so we honor you and salute you for the work that you do every single day on behalf of black history. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, okay, so before I go to the development review items, um, I, there are a number of people that we lost nationwide um, in the commission or who are part and parcel of our commission family. Um, and in our community and our, and our nation. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge some of them. First of all, the victims of the deadly suicide bombing explosion in Syria, that's such a travesty. The victims of the Nairobi uh, hotel terrorist attack. Um, we also want to remember the inimitable Carol Channing, who, who died at, at age 97. Um, she's an amazing actress, uh, featured at Broadway's Hello, Dolly. Um, and, and gentlemen prefer blondes, um, and she was an icon and advocate in the LBGTQ community as well. We also want to acknowledge the passing of Eugene Kennedy, who was the former mayor of the city of Seat Pleasant, the city of excellence, the city of, smart city of excellence now. Um, and we also want to remember Barbara Ann Galenas, who was the mother of Andrea Davey, who recently retired as our public affairs officer. Um, she was aged 91. Um, recently passed, and she's also the grandmother of our own Ellen Walter, who is uh, in, the, in the Department of Public, the Department of Parks and Recreation, Public Affairs and Marketing Division. Uh, we also want to remember all of those who are affected 
Um, actually, every last one of us is affected by the government shutdown, but there are some who are, who are affected um, in, in, in very egregious, hard-hitting ways, and we want you to remember them. And, and there's so many community efforts um, to reach out to those people, because many people in the, in the world are paycheck to paycheck. And, um, and when you don't have your paycheck coming in, that wreaks havoc. It's a terrible snowball effect. So you, there are ways that you can reach out in your community. I know that the commission is doing an awful lot. We are waiving our fees for those who are uh, gov federal government employees who um, are affected by the shutdown. We're waiving our fees for our recreation um, facilities and for um, our child care and kid care, uh, facility, uh, child care programs. Um, but, but I noticed everyone stepping up to the plate. Our, our new county executive, Angela Alsobrooks, is stepping up in every way the county is. And there are ways that you can do something, too, in your community, your church, ho however you do it. But we need to step up. I also wanted to. Uh, Chair, yes. Uh, just, <clears throat> just to announce that the uh, Council of Governments for the region has an entire listing of all of the agencies uh, in the region that are providing assistance to those federal employees who are furloughed or not getting paid, as well as for uh, those that are contractors. Thank you. So if I could have the, a moment of silence then for all of those and just uh, your own silent prayer for uh, the p folks affected by the government shutdown. Thank you. I would point out that, again, this is January. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, thank God, thank goodness we're here, right here in our new facility, uh, back in our space where we're still getting used to this technology, but at least the microphones work a lot better. <laughs> um, I do want to say January is Financial Wellness Month, Get Organized Month, uh, um, so things that, all those things that we need to jump on. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, Madam Chair, can I also yes. just mention to keep in our thoughts um, the people of Zimbabwe? Yes. So I don't know if you've been following the news, but the president has recently left their country, and prior to doing that on an official trip that he's taking, he increased gasoline prices up to $12 per gallon, which is one of the highest in the, the world that you would insane. see. Um, it has a disparate effect upon the people that live there. Um, they're going through a lot of political turmoil and um, acts of violence right now, and our U.S. Embassy has most of our people who are working there for the State Department and other NGOs actually inside the doors because they're, they're fearful of the people um, that are working there on our behalf that are trying to help the people there. So keep everyone of Zimbabwe in your thoughts and prayers as well, please. Thank you. Um, I would say, okay, so it's January 17th, and 99 years ago on January 17th, 1920, prohibition went into effect as a result of the 18th Amendment. Um, and in 1821, uh, Mexico permitted uh, Moses Austin um, and 300 families to settle in Texas, and hence we have Austin, Texas. Uh, 1929 was the first appearance of Popeye. Um, January 17, 1950 was the infamous um, Brinks robbery, and I know there's movies about it, books about it, and uh, that was in Boston, and it was the Brinks office building, and they got away with over $2 million, which translates to $28 million um, in today's um, market although they did get busted later. Um, January 17th, 1961, 22 year old Oscar Robertson, known to most of us as the Big O, be, uh, became the youngest player ever to receive all-star uh, MVP honors. Um, January 17th, 1970, uh, sp um, Sporting News named the Say Hey Kid Willie Mays as player of the decade, the 1960s decade. January 17, 1927, Eartha Kitt, the inimitable, dynamic, sexy, Eartha Kitt was born, and her number one hit was what? Santa Baby, oh come on, okay, Santa Baby. Okay, uh, ninth, uh, January 17, um, uh, 1970, uh, Crooner Billy Stewart was killed in a car accident. I don't know if you remember him, but he, Crooner, beautiful love songs. I do love you, sitting in the park in his iconic summertime. Mm -hmm. um, 1976, Benny, Barry Manilow recorded his single, I Write the Songs. Um, and then I wanted to say, of course, 
we just had the official, the real birthday, it's celebrated later, but the real birthday of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which was January 15th, the civil rights champion, servant leader, who led his, his work, led to um, the civil rights amendment, and, and so much, so much, um, um, that, and we owe such a tremendous debt of gratitude to him, and he knew that he wasn't gonna make it. He knew he wasn't gonna make it, so I don't know where we would have been without him. Um, and speaking of that, I wanted to give a shout out um, because the University of Maryland Capital Region Health presented its inaugural Martin Luther King Community of Courage Award to the Maryland National Capital uh, Park Police in Prince George's County, specifically to Chief Stanley Johnson and Lieutenant Ver uh, Vereen Barton of the Park Police for their um, really successful uh, carrying a uh, Shatter the Silence program to eradicate domestic violence. So um, I had the pleasure of attending that yesterday. It was just, it was wonderful. So we want to extend congratulations to them too. While we are extending congratulations, I want to say congratulations to our own. He was a commission uh, employee in our legal department, Jared McCarthy, who has, is now serving on the circuit court for Prince George's County. He was appointed by Governor Hogan um, to this uh, circuit court, so Jared McCarthy, want to give a shout out to him. And then Sarah Gomez Lane. Sarah Gomez Lane was the first place winner of the 2018 Doodle for Google contest. She is a second grader in the DC area whose uh, winning drawing was featured as an interactive logo on Google's website. But what was significant is that her drawing was inspired by Park and Planning's Dinosaur Park in Laurel, Maryland. So um, her, she's a future paleontologist and she received a $30,000 college scholarship and her school received $50,000 to spend on technology. We think that's pretty awesome and we are glad that we provided the inspiration. Um, we wanted to say a uh, happy birthday to Marie Proctor, our technical hearing writer. We didn't, she wasn't here with us last week. Happy birthday to our planning board administrator, Jessica Jones, over there. Both of y'all got to raise your hands. B happy birthday to former planning board members. This is key. So t um, former planning board member Albert Scott, who turned 80, and former vice chair Ely, and I got to spend time with him yesterday, who turned 94, 94 years young. And as always, uh, we close out with food because that's what we do. So <laughs> it is National Hot Tea Month, National Soup Month. As I said, I think they think we get sick in January. It's National Oat no, Oatmeal Month and National Sunday Supper Month, something that we need to get back to So um, with family suppers. So I think that covers all that I wanted to announce. And without further ado, I'm, I'm going to... Um, I, I'm going to start with um, the consent agenda. Is there anyone here to oppose the staff's recommendation on four, item 4D or any board member who wishes to discuss? Madam Chair, for consideration of the recommendation on 4D, I'm We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, so item nine is a, a, a resolution. Is it, anybody um, want to talk? Okay, Mr. Kennedy. Is it working? Okay. Yes, thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, for the record, my name is Rastafari Kenny II of the Subdivision and Zoning Section. Um, item 9 before you is a resolution for CP16002, Indian Queen Point Road. This item was continued from January 10th, 2019 to incorporate findings and conditions made at the public hearing for the case which was on January 10th as well. Staff has distributed a revised finding exhibit which should be made to this resolution. Staff is recommending approval of the resolution with these edits. Um, I, 
speak on the resolution? Is there a motion? Just a question for staff. Is this the was this the front footage setback that the that had been agreed upon? Yes, ninety okay, feet. And, and the owners are fined, and the other people are yes, and everyone else. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Item five, followed by six. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Board. For the record, my name is Rastafari Kenny II with the Subdivision and Zoning Section. Item 5 before you is a conservation plan for the establishment of a single-family detached dwelling located within the Chesapeake Bay Critical Area Intensely Development Overlay Zone. Construction of the single-family detached dwelling proposes a lot coverage of 32.1%, exceeding the 30% lot coverage maximum established in the R55 zone which necessitates the variance requested as part of the subject application. The site's general location in the county can be seen here and more specifically shows that the property is located in planning area 68 within Council District 2. The site vicinity map shows the property's location within the neighborhood including surrounding roads and property boundaries. The subject property is located within the R55 or the one family detached residential zone surrounded by similarly zoned properties to the north, east, east, south, and west. The property is within the, is within the IDO designation within the CBCA. The subject application is also located within the 2004 Gateway Arts District DDO, but is subject to the R55 development standards as discussed on page nine of the technical staff report. This aerial photograph shows the entire back property boundary outlined in red. <coughs> the map of the site shows the natural conditions of the area, showing the topography as delineated with contour lines. The site is relatively flat within, with no environmental features on site. The site map shows an existing dwelling which has since been raised in 2015. The master plan right away shows the property outlined in blue. There are no master plan roads abutting the property. This map provides a bird's eye view of the subject property. This conservation plan was valued against the requirements of the zoning ordinance, the Prince George's County Landscape Manual, DDO applicability, the Woodland and Wildlife Habitat Conservation Ordinance, requirements of the Tree Canopy Coverage Ordinance, variance criteria, as well as referral comments received. It should be noted that the applicant is requesting for Condition 3 to be deleted as written approval was received by DPI after the publishing of the technical staff report satisfying the condition. Therefore, staff recommends that the Planning Board adopt the findings of this report and approve CP18001 for Munch Cold Property as well as a variance to lack coverage for the construction of a single family detached dwelling subject to the conditions in the staff report, as well as the deletion of condition three. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Are there questions of Mr. Kennedy? I have no one on the sign up sheet. Was there anyone who wished to here to speak on this matter? Does the board have any questions of anyone? I just have a question as to whether or not there's any requirement. I didn't see any for using some sort of uh, Pervious uh, materials. Since right now, as I understand it, it's totally it's totally vacant, right? And there's yes. no impervious surface. So now we're going to substantial part of impervious surface. So whether or not there was any consideration given to allow for proper drainage. That is a question I'll defer to Chuck Schneider about. Sure, that's fine. Chuck Schneider, the Environmental Planning Section. Um, Pervious pavers can be used for stormwater management purposes, mm -hmm. but for the critical area, the way that we look at pervious pavers over time, they're not going to let water through. So we don't include them in our calculations, but they're used for stormwater management calculations. Okay. 
I'll put it that way. Um, it's really nice to do, but over time it doesn't work because you're driving over top of it. Usually people like to put it in their driveway, mm -hmm. and you're driving over top of it. Next thing you know, the, the holes get filled up with various grid or whatever, and next thing you know, it won't let water go through. So when you, initial it sounds good, but later on it takes maintenance to, to clean that, and usually homeowners don't maintain that. Are there any other questions of Mr. Schneider or anyone else? Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve CP-18001 and variance to section 27-442C along with the associated conditions <coughs> outlined in staff's report. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, we're going to go to item six, and while we're going to item, setting up for item six, I was remiss in not saying happy birthday to two more people. First of all, Betty White, comedian, just an actress who just turned 97 today. Um, it, it proves my theory that comedy is, is, um, is really good for longevity. So um, <laughs> George Burns, Bob Hope lived to be over 100 years old. Um, um, Dick Van Dyke is 93, Betty White 97. There's something to this. So happy birthday. And then finally, happy birthday to the iconic First Lady, Michelle Robinson Obama, who turned double nickels today. So happy birthday, um, former First Lady, Michelle Obama. Good morning, Madam Chair, and members of the planning board. For the record, this is Henry Zan with Urban Design Section. Item six in front of you is a detailed site plan for a 1155 parking spaces garage with serving the Prince of George's Regional Hospital, now is known as University of Maryland Medical Center. Uh, the site is in Plain Area 73, Council District 6. Uh, this is the site vicinity map. Uh, this is uh, Lossford Road. This is Medical Center Drive. Uh, the site basically is on the uh, larger site, which uh, previously known as CAP Center. The original uh, DSP for this case approved the entire site uh, with the hospital center here and uh, the, sh the remaining shopping center as a future development site. Uh, the site is in the MXT zone uh, with uh, uh, Development, over, development industry overlay zone superimposed by the 2013 Largo Town Center sector plan and sectional map amendment. Uh, this is basically uh, the entire uh, hospital center side. Uh, this is map show the overlay zone covered the entire property. Uh, this is the aerial photo. Uh, it's not up to the date, uh, but uh, currently the hospital main building in the campus here uh, on the construction and uh, a lot of uh, foundation has been put it in. The site specifically for this parking garage is, is here uh, show uh, in this uh, envelope. Uh, this envelope is basically leveled and uh, it was approved in the original uh, 14028. In that approval on the staff report page number seven uh, the planning board approved four amendments to the DDOZ standards which established the site for this uh, parking garage. Actually today uh, the approval is pretty simple. It's basically the introduction of the new uh, architecture to this site. Uh, a prior approval condition basically required this detailed site plan prior to assurance of the building permit, uh, excuse me, Assurance of use and occupancy permit of the hospital, they had to get approved. Uh, this is the master plan right away uh, exhibit. You see the medical center and lots for road are the major roadway. Uh, this is the capital beltway. Uh, the existing site is here. Uh, one more uh, exhibit. Uh, this is the footprint of the parking garage. Uh, the site will be accessed uh, through here, the access from uh, both access here and here through Healthcare Way. And uh, this is the medical center drive. 
uh, the building is basically in an L shape. Uh, in future, the applicant indicated uh, with the uh, possible expansion if it's uh, required or if it's necessary for the parking need. Uh, this is the elevation of the parking garage. You see here we have uh, show a lot of uh, uh, architecture articulation. Basically, um, was uh, uh, in included based on the input from both the community uh, surrounding these areas and also, most importantly, uh, the Largo Development Town Center Review Board. Uh, mainly, the design of this parking garage uh, basically draws significantly from two sources. One is the existing medical center building, uh, the main building which you see the same uh, color and uh, finish palette of this vertically uh, divided uh, element, and also uh, from the tapestry across the street. And then uh, this is a very uh, difficult uh, design project, but uh, I believe they achieved what uh, has been envisioned uh, by the sector plan. I have uh, several perspectives to basically show you uh, how it all looks like when it's built. Uh, basically, you will see this uh, uh, articulation of the of the building and uh, and the surrounding. This is this is a Lotsford Road at the intersection of Lotsford Road and Medical Center Drive. And you see here, this is the existing tapestry building, which is a vertical mixed-use building. Uh, another shot uh, from the uh, Medical Center, Medical Center Drive. Uh, th this is that piece of the uh, green areas which will be for possible future expansion of the uh, parking garage. Uh, one more shot of the corner uh, to go to the campus. Uh, this, this DSP has been reviewed for conformance for, for all the applicable uh, regulations and the requirements, and uh, no agency opposed the uh, approval of this detailed site plan. In your backup, uh, they should have a memo from the Largo Town Center Development Board, which dated uh, January 14, which I, we, we received uh, yesterday. Uh, basically, they expressed the support of this proposal. Uh, Urban design staff recommend the plan board adopt the finding of this report and approve the detailed site plan uh, in two parts. Part one, they, there are two amendments to the uh, did you use the standards. One is the amendment because of that the landscape strip here. Uh, did you use it required a very urban type of the tree planting along the frontage and then uh, giving this will be uh, possible future expansion. Currently, this is just the interim situation. And then staff recommend approval of that amendment. And then the, the other amendment is to increase the maximum uh, parking number. And then, as you know, uh, this sector plan capped the parking for each uses in the core areas of this sector plan. And uh, because of the redesign of the floor plan of the parking garage, they end up with additional 92 spaces. And then staff also recommend approval of the increase of the 92 parking spaces. Uh, recommendation part B is basically recommend approval of this detailed site plan, ESP 14028-02, with one condition on page 11 to 12 of the staff report. Uh, this concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of Mr. Zhang at this time? Just a question which okay. maybe the applicant can, can address, but in the current street view that we have there, how do the cars that are driving by have any idea what's behind the parking structure? Are they going to have something on the parking structure that would at least indicate kind of what's beyond there or kind of uniquely identify it so it's just not a big, huge building right there? So on the other sides, I see emblems and other things that are kind of identifying what the structure represents, but not on the actual side that runs parallel with the, the street. And maybe I can leave that for the applicant if they want to address that. Or 
Shaw, go ahead and I'll leave that for the applicant. Because I'm okay. not sure if Mr. Zang, you know, but I'll leave okay. that for them. Okay, okay let's you. see if there are any other questions for Mr. Zang at this time. Are there? All right, Mr. Ship. You can adjust the microphone to your height. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Commission for the Record, Bill Ship with uh, O'Malley, Miles, and Calverton here today on behalf of the applicant, which is the Revenue Authority, Prince George's County. Um, I want to start out by saying uh, I think I'm in a parallel universe because Mr. Renninger told me to hurry up and be short. <laughs> We've been working very closely with Mr. Renninger and, and his group. Um, as Henry did a, a great job of summarizing, I want to thank Henry for his work not just on this part of the application, the O2, uh, but also, am I still coming through? Uh, all along on the application for the original hospital. One of the reasons this one is uh, shorter is because a lot of the work was done in the first time around on the hospital project. But what was very important about this uh, review was the architecture. And we had uh, worked very closely on that. What we took the approach of, we submitted, or before we submitted, we started out with a plan that was fairly generic in terms of the garage design and went and got feedback. And boy, did we get some feedback uh, from many stakeholders. Uh, but what evolved was what you see is, is uh, vertical elements of brick, uh, the uh, horizontal spandrels with the grooved uh, treatment we call uh, version A uh, that uh, provides articulation in the horizontal panels. It's not just flat concrete. And then also at the, the base level, the pedestrian level, a different treatment of the spandrels uh, so that it provides more of a pedestrian feeling and then a different treatment higher up. And that was based on comments from staff. All of the colors do match the palette of the hospital. So the brick is the, the hospital brick. The, the other panels are the cream color from the hospital and the glass on the uh, stairwells are the glass from the hospital uh, meant to, to be very compatible, but also in that discussion was the, the suggestion that we be looking at the tapestry across the street uh, and the colors of the hospital already and the colors then on the garage are very compatible with the earth tones and, and the treatment of the color palette on the tapestry as well. We have emblematic uh, kind of logo signs at the top of the garage. Uh, you can see it in one right there in the one that's up now kind of in the foreground. Uh, and there's one at the other end on um, the main entrance, Harry S. Truman. Uh, but we did not put anything on the uh, parallel uh, wall facing uh, Medical Center Drive. Uh, phase one, phase two we'll have. Right, for the garage. The, with the expansion of the, the phase two piece there. Um, we did not oversign the, the garage because the sector plan really discourages that, but what we do have is a very detailed wayfinding plan throughout the medical campus to get people to where they need to go, uh, both from the uh, Harry S. Truman entrances, but once you get into the site that tell you which way to go for emergency, which one to go for ambulatory care, which one to go to the main entrance, and, and then employee uh, uh, directional signage as well, more on the, the metro side. So I really... Um, don't want to take too much of your time because I know you have a full agenda, but I know this is an important project. We are very anxious to keep it moving uh, because it does need to catch up with the hospital construction. Um, and we're looking forward to moving forward. And, and if we're lucky enough to get approval today, working with staff to get a quick turnaround on the resolution. Are there questions of Mr. Ship? Oh, so, yes, Commissioner Dorner. So just sort of on the emblem, I, I can see it there on the corner that's on the same side as the, the sign that's in the, the sort of lower left corner there. Would you be able to move the emblem over just to the street side? Because it looks like, I mean, it's almost kind of like repetitive where you have the sign in that lower left corner on the grass and then you have on that side of the building the emblem as well. I mean, maybe there's a, a reason. I like the rest of the structure. I think you did great on the earth tones and stuff. But just on the side that the, street, that the cars are driving on, um, there's really nothing kind of branding that building to show that it, it belongs to the hospital. Obviously, you would see it as you continue to drive by, but it might be a nice extra touch. Right. I, th I think the architectural concept was that the design of the building ties it to the hospital. And if you see it the, in the background, the hospital, the same emblem yeah, exactly, on yeah. the top there. So that one's facing out towards Lotsford or Medical Center Drive. 
Yeah, and then the one on the garage faces towards Lotsford, actually. So it's meant to kind of complement it. Um, and, and, you know, the, the architects and designers kind of tell us uh, where to go with that and also uh, with right. input from UMS. Uh, this was their preferred alternative. So um, I personally don't have a, a strong objection to what you're saying, but I'm reluctant to make changes now uh, that we're this far back. Yeah, and, and, and I don't want to make huge changes. I was just wondering if, if it could be done because it, right now, like unless you're a bird and you're flying up above the parking garage, you're not going to see the hospital beyond that um, if you're on the street side. But as you're approaching it, you will. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I understand the comment, and, uh, you know, there's probably a little bit of flexibility in certification process to move from one wall to the other. But yeah. one of the things I don't want to get into, if you know, obviously the commissioners, you have the control, but... I don't want to necessarily agree to something without going back and looking through all the guidelines that govern signage and find out that we've uh, agreed on something that requires us to come back for a modification. Yeah, but no, but I can not. take the comment, and, and I also want to discuss with our, our stakeholders and with the Largo Development Board before. I'm not, I'm not trying to be disagreeable. I just want to make sure. No, that's fine, and I'm not trying to slow yeah. you down. I just wanted to make it as a suggestion to look at. If, as mm -hmm. long as it's not in conflict with the sector plan or anything else going forward, Fair I enough. wouldn't have any objection to putting it on the street. It, might, it actually might enhance the project to a certain extent. Visually. I understand that the intent um, of the comment. Yeah. We'd be happy okay. to have that discussion. Okay. Because I know that you've met with everyone uh, in the community, and it seems like right now the community is in agreement. I will wait to hear from someone who's who's actually present, who didn't even sign up to speak, according to my my my, my sign up sheet. Um, <laughs> so um, I knew that would happen. So, are there any other questions for Mr. Ship at this moment? And let's see, so everyone else, most of these folks are with you. Um, yes, ma'am. Who is there? Anyone who wished to speak? Mr. Manigret, is, did you, you signed up not to speak, but you are coming <laughs> and because you, you want to say something. That Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Charles Renninger, President of Largo Civic Association. I'm also a member of the Largo Development Board, and I can tell you I think there'd be some issues if we attempted to put the sign on Arena Drive. Uh, there are some specific guidelines, very specific guidelines concerning signage and height of signage and dimensions of signage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This project, uh, we have met with the Revenue Authority, and I do thank them for the numerous times that we met and the compromises and concessions that they agreed to so that the community could feel that this was something we could come down here support and that the Development Authority would come down here and support. And I'm afraid if we start tweaking any conditions, including signage, uh, you may get an appeal or you may get a request to go to the District of Council to deal with that issue. So I would encourage that you leave what we've got designed and what everybody at this point is in consensus. I will remind you, as Mr. Ship pointed out, this is phase one for the parking garage. If you notice the grassy plaza that exists along Arena Drive, at future phases, it is anticipated there will be additional garage added at that location. The grass will disappear. The building will be pulled to streetscape. And at that point, if you want to deal with the signage when everyone will once again have an opportunity to review the issue, I think it would be more appropriate, particularly if you put a sign up now, you're putting the revenue authority or somebody through the burden and the expense of putting a sign up that is going to be hopefully short term. Thank you. Thank you. Was there anyone else who wished to speak whose name I did not call? Does the board have any questions of anyone? Mr. Chip, anything to add? Is there a motion? Madam Chair, move that we adopt the findings of staff uh, and approve DSP-14028-02 along with the associated condition as outlined in staff's report in addition to approving the alternative development district standards as outlined in um, section A1 and 2 of staff's report. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, Madam Vice Chair just brought up, well, I already had this letter, but the letter was timely, right? The yeah. letter from the Largo um, Town no. Center Development Board. Ms. Proctor? Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Item seven. Items seven will be followed by eight, um, and then we will go to 3D, and if we have time, we'll go to um, 
um, back to 3B for lunch. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Board. For the record, this is Henry Zhang with Urban Design Section. Uh, item 7 in front of you is a detailed site plan for a 57,845 square feet of a commercial shopping center known as retail at Melford Town Center. Uh, the site is in Plain Area 71B, Council District 4. It's located here. And uh, uh, the site vicinity map shows this, this is the uh, specific location of the shopping center. Uh, this is the US 301, this is the John Hansen Highway, and then the site basically is located at the intersection of Melford Boulevard and the East-West Boulevard, basically in two sections. Uh, the site is in MXT zone. Uh, this site has, has a very long history, which dated back to 1982. Uh, but most recently, in 2006, uh, the Bui Master Plan resumed the property to the MXT zone. And currently, there are one conceptual site plan, 0602, a preliminary plan of subdivision, 4-1606, and a detailed site plan, 17020, governing this property. Uh, this is the aerial photo show that the two sections of this shopping center basically wooded, and then this is the uh, historic uh, cemetery of Malford House, and then the Malford House here is located here. Uh, there are significant environmental features here, and, uh, and uh, uh, some slope here on the side. Uh, this is the master plan uh, right-of-way map show Malford as a collector roadway, and once again, this is the site of this detailed site plan in two, section, two sections here. Oh, this is rendered site plan, uh, show a very clear uh, layout of the shopping center. Uh, access mainly will be provided through uh, Melford Boulevard here. This is the new uh, roadway C, and then this east-west boulevard, which, will, uh, which also in the middle of the two section. And then there are five specific buildings here show on this site plan, uh, but the those three buildings, which one, two, three, building one, two, and three, uh, will be a multi-tenants building, and they has, uh, have a very specific architecture uh, elevations proposed that I will show you later on. And then building four and five, basically, it's kind of a placeholder. Uh, even though the applicant indicated building four will be future restaurant, but uh, we don't have any idea of the building five. And then you see here parking mainly provided on this, uh, in the middle of, the, of this side. And then uh, future parking for this uh, restaurant will be provided uh, through the park surface parking over here. Uh, there is a linear park uh, proposed along this side of East West Boulevard and the fronting the stormwater management pond here. And then there's a also outdoor seating areas for this possible future restaurant will be also fronting the uh, stormwater management pond. Uh, I will have uh, additional exhibits show the elevations of those multi-tenants building. So let me ask you this. Okay. So you are using your cursor, but we can't follow on these new tech screens. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. So we want fault. you to. We it. want we you to. We want you to use it, but we yeah. just can't. It's, it's not, not showing. It's not. Is it showing? Up? I can't see if it's, it's showing. showing. Up. No, it's not over there. It's just okay. on my screen. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. Thank you. We'll keep okay. going. It's okay. And those are the uh, elevations proposed for those three multi-tenants building. You see here, uh, the design is very. Uh, powerful uh, in terms of uh, visual uh, articulation. And then they, they have a lot of uh, tower elements which will be uh, on this uh, prominent location. Uh, building basically is finished predominantly with brick. And then there are uh, cementitious uh, elements also proposed. Um, I have uh, several exhibits just show different sides. Basically four sides of the elevation has been shown and then with canopy and then also building mounted signage here, you see, uh, I, I mean, still there? I, 
I don't have anything on that screen, but it's on my screen too. Okay. Okay. Um, can you exit the PowerPoint and go back into power and slide your mode? Well, okay. I see. <laughs> Mr. Crime, we have a problem. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is just the additional elevations uh, uh, on different sides of the different building. Uh, one, one, one more slide, and then uh, you see building mounted sign and the possible future tenant sign also proposed. Uh, under the CSP approval, there is a comprehensive design guideline which uh, you know, talking about how the building will be designed, how the signage will be, and then this is basically uh, consistent with the uh, approved design guideline. There are also one monumental sign and uh, one pylon sign uh, proposed for this uh, PSP. This is the primary identification uh, monumental sign at the intersection of uh, East West Boulevard and the Melford Boulevard. And then we'll be finished with all break in the, uh, with the primary identification information on it. Oh, the, there's no agency opposed to approval of this detailed site plan. HPC review this application and then recommend the approval of the proposal. Uh, this is just a, a fly through the entire uh, town center. Uh, I will just click it and then I, I will just uh, introduce you. This is the shopping center we're looking at. Uh, the, there are uh, four buildings proposed on this side and the, the one possible future restaurant side is over here. This is the Malford Boulevard, and this is the East West Boulevard. And then this is the historic cemetery of uh, belong to Malford House. And then this is the multi-family um, um, complex approved last year, I believe, uh, by the planning board is Aspen. And uh, you see here, that's the historic site of Malford House. And then uh, following this item, item eight, we'll have uh, infrastructure uh, DSP for townhouses. Those will be those townhouses in next uh, uh, proposal. Uh, with this urban design, recommend planning board adopt the finding of this report and uh, to approve detailed site plan 18026. And then I forgot to mention the AC. There's an AC. Uh, 18017, uh, basically they asked for the relief from section 4.2 along the frontage of the east, east west uh, uh, boulevard and also uh, 4.3 <coughs> for the surface parking lots and then 4.7, that's the buffer yard between um, this historic cemetery and uh, uh, possible future restaurant site. Uh, this AC has been recommended by the planning director and included uh, in DSP on page 33 to 38. Uh, also, this DSP includes type two tree conservation plan TCP 2-036-99-13. Uh, for retail at Melford Town Center subject to three conditions on the staff report. This concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any questions of Mr. Zhang? Thank you. Mr. Antonetti. <coughs> Morning, Madam Chair, uh, members of the planning board. For the record, Robert Antonetti of the law firm of Ship Lane Horn here on behalf of the applicant, St. John Properties, Inc. Um, I do have uh, with us today uh, Representative St. John, uh, Mr. Andrew Roud, Regional Partner, uh, Ken Finley, Development Manager, Steve Zayner, Director of Landscaping and Design, and Jen Hearn, Developer Coordinator. Um, we also have Mr. Neil Greenberg, who is a uh, Development Partner uh, in the Melford Town Center with Somerset Construction. And um, this is our retail team. We also have our townhouse team, which will be the next case. Um, we have Mr. Rich Lushke, uh, the architect. Um, and we have Mr. Chris Rizzi, Bowler Engineering, the uh, engineering and landscape architects for the project. I'd like to thank staff um, and Mr. Zhang uh, particularly for his work uh, and efforts in reviewing this case and putting the staff report together. Um, this is the Melford Town Center. I think this board um, knows, uh, knows the situation. Um, 
our exhibit? No, this is, this is uh, an applicant's exhibit, which I, I will, will transition to quickly. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, this is for the Melford Town Center. This is the retail component uh, that was approved um, in the conceptual site plan, that, which the board has reviewed and approved, and the preliminary plan of subdivision, which the board has reviewed and approved as recently as 2017. And uh, it is really uh, an exciting element to add to the mix of uses at Melford. Just for background, Melford um, has a long history of development as, a, as an employment center. Um, and as part of its, um, that employment development uh, over the years, it's developed and or received approval for up to 1.5 million square feet of employment uses in the form of office buildings and uh, research and development space. Uh, Melford, the Melford Town Center is basically the, the center of that project and it is really a new vision, the new vision of mixed use, the mixed use uh, not being a fad but really a requirement for uh, successful projects, uh, particularly which uh, rely heavily on employment uses. Um, the thought is that you need to have the amenities to draw in uh, employers and employees and those, that really requires a synergy of two additional uses. One, residential uses, which the board has seen in part with the uh, Aspen multifamily building, which has been approved, and also the retail component, which is a very important aspect of whether employers want to locate within a particular park. They want to be proximate to services, restaurants, um, et cetera. So all these things work together. So this retail village, um, actually it is, it is named the Retail Village East. I, I understand it says retail at Melford, uh, at the Melford Town Center, but the technical part is the Retail Village East. Um, the reason for that is it's on the east side of Melford Boulevard. There's also some opportunity for retail on the west side, and that, um, uh, when that moves forward, that'll come forth in a future detailed site plan. Um, Mr. Zhang is correct. This does show three buildings. Um, that have uh, that are shown on the rendered site plan, which is also part of the staff exhibit. Um, what you what you have here on the televisions, and I'm sorry, I'm thrown a little bit, um, looking left or right. Um, this is an exhibit which uh, I thought would be good for the record for the board to have, and I do have some eight and a half by 11s. If, you're, if you have any trouble um, seeing them, I'll just hand I'm hand them out. But I would ask that it be marked. I'm seeing this because it's on my screen. It's like three inches thick. So trying, to, you can't do I it. I think we can fix that. that um, and I don't mean to belabor the presentation, but um. uh, this this is a rendered site plan with with perspectives, <laughs> architectural perspectives. So is this several pages. Is that the extent of your PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll have the um, PowerPoint and the associated printed version marked and accepted into the record as applicants exhibit number one. Okay. And uh, you know, for your perusal, um, this, uh, this exhibit uh, basically shows um, some views. You've seen the elevations. Well, here's how they would look in a perspective view. Um, if you would advance to the next slide, um, these, this is the uh, retail building one um, at the mouth of the intersection of Melford Boulevard and the East West Boulevard, or uh, I think its future name will be Lake Melford <coughs> Avenue. Um, and um, as you can see to the to the left, there is a there is a there is a sign a monument sign on the left side. Uh, this, uh, and if you proceed to the next slide. Um, Here's a perspective of moving down uh, future Lake Melford Avenue um, and uh, views of, of the architecture. Um, I will say the architecture, is, uh, while it doesn't copy the Melford House, it's in, you know, it echoes many of the details of the Melford House. It has uh, masonry material, uh, it has parapet walls, it has a two-story appearance, um, it has some metal seam roof um, elements into it. Um, it is actually a four-sided building. That means it's finished on all four sides. Um, the uh, buildings one, two, and three, which is the architecture before you today, um, has the opportunity to be accessed from either side, either from the street side or from the parking lot, which is behind the buildings. Um, so they're very attractively designed and uh, really are flexible. Uh, they could be taken by multiple users, by a single user in a building, uh, if a large restaurant would, want to be, would go in there. But um, we're 
uh, St. John is, and uh, Somerset are willing to move forward and develop these uh, in, a, in a speculative way, uh, a speculative way without having an absolute tenant in hand because they think the interest is there and they feel that the retail is that important to the success of this overall project. Um, just going through the, sl the slides quickly, um, here's uh, some, some images. Uh, oh, you've already gone through the slides. <laughs> uh, now, well, uh, you, can, you can flip through them at your perusal, but they are elevation um, um, perspectives which really show uh, the interaction between the streetscape, the buildings themselves, uh, really gives that, that urban, um, urban design that was approved in the conceptual site plan and in design guidelines this board and the technical staff has reviewed. So um, we're very excited to get moving on this. Um, in the future, um, we will have for the other two buildings that are shown in the retail villages, um, one hopefully will be for uh, a small grocer, uh, and then hopefully the other one up against the lake will be for a, a large white tablecloth sit-down restaurant, which uh, we're actively pursuing. When we have the architecture identified associated with a user, we'll come back with a revision to the detailed site plan and present that accordingly. Um, this application uh, was presented to the city of Bowie. Um, Mr. Stevens is here on behalf of the city. The city is in support of it. Um, it is consistent with uh, all the criteria in the conceptual site plan for, a commercial, for the commercial area of this project. It does respect the, uh, the view corridors, uh, particularly one relevant to this application is the view corridor between the Melford House and the uh, historic Duckett Cemetery that's up on a knoll. Um, the applicant does own that cemetery and it does have a a uh, timetable for um, renovation of that cemetery area um, and it's uh, been approved as a historic area work permit uh, with the Historic Preservation Commission. It'll entail mostly a mulch trail, cleaning up of some of the overgrowth and uh, I think ultimately the erection of a, uh, of a wrought iron type fence around it to appropriate deline appropriately delineate the area plus some interpretive signage uh, which will be included um, uh, as part of that resource. Uh, so with that being said, we do rec um, recommend and support uh, staff's recommendation of approval with conditions. Um, however, we do have a few mi uh, minor clarifications uh, to the conditions which we've already reviewed in detail with staff, which um, they are uh, in agreement with, and I'll, but I'll let them confirm that. Yes, actually I forgot to mention that in my presentation, sorry for that. I would um, ask that that be submitted into the record and marked appropriately, Madam Chair. Okay. We have um, draft revised conditions um, that have been submitted by the applicant and we'll have them marked and accepted into the record as applicants exhibit number two. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and these conditions, I won't, I won't belabor going through them in detail, but they're mostly for clarification um, dealing with items such as landscaping, um, uh, impacts uh, from the buffer yards from some of the landscape uh, buffers that are proposed uh, throughout this project. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm willing to answer to be, any questions. I'm uh, looking at it. They seem to be um, just what you said, pretty much clarification, self-explanatory. It's very colorful as well. Uh, <laughs> I finally do it. Uh -huh. finally. <laughs> well, except for resolutions. that's right. Mr. Tedesco uses three, but okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so, um, with that, that that would conclude um, the applicant's uh, presentation. Uh, and actually, there there is one one more exhibit that I'd like to put into the record. Um, just to point out, there were, uh, if, you, if you look at, um, there, there is a condition uh, that, a condition 1N that is, on, uh, that is on the revised condition sheet and it talks about uh, as part of the alternative compliance adding either three tr shade trees or six ornamental trees and we've actually located um, an area where, where the three, uh, Please identify it again for me. It's a landscape uh, exhibit. Okay, here we go. Okay, yep. I apologize. Okay. So you have um, a proposed landscape um, exhibit that you're submitting into the record and it'll be marked and accepted as applicant's exhibit number three. And um, yes, Mr. Zhang or 
have you had you you've seen this or not seen yeah. this? Yes, yes, we we we, okay. we saw it previously. Okay, and and um, we we agree. Okay, I agree. Uh, <laughs> that being said, I just wanted to give context to condition one N, which is in the revision sheet, to show where we would plant these three additional shade trees in kind of the seating area, which is an amenity uh, for the retail village east. Um, so uh, with that uh, submission, uh, uh, we thank you for your consideration. We um, respectfully request uh, your support for this application, and we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, okay. Commissioner Dorner. So I want to thank you for all these visual aids because it's hard to see on these screens. Like the chair has a three by three, if, if yeah. that image, and ours is extremely small on our new monitors. Yeah. And we yeah. can't maximize the image and zoom mm -hmm. in or anything. I have my own computer here that I can, but not everyone does. So having these visual aids is good until we figure out how okay. to actually do Very that. Very good. We'll so do. until we figure that out, that's it, it's good to proceed in that way. Um, and I really like the level of detail that you put into this project. It looks really good. Mm -hmm. Um, you've got a lot of extremely realistic de um, parts of here, and I particularly like what you can see on this image, the color differences with the street and the pedestrian cr uh, crosswalks to draw visual attention um, to people crossing. You also have turning radii that will slow down cars as, as they're going through here for more pedestrian safety. Um, I just wanted to clarify two things, since you, you even got very high-end details in some of the images that I won't mention, but I think are appealing to certain kinds of people and customers in here. Um, but since you do have a lot of detail, I, I want to just clarify in a few of these slides, you don't have some of the intersections that are ADA compliant. You don't have curb cuts in the sidewalks. So I just want to verify you actually are going to do that. Yes, okay. absolutely, yes. All right, good. And then um, you also, in the staff report, it talks about three bike racks, which are conspicuously missing from all of these visual aids. So I just want to make sure that you will have bike racks um, throughout the site in some places. Yes, uh, and right, and the, yes, we will. And the perspectives here were really shown to, to highlight main elements of the building. But the, uh, if yeah. the bike racks were left off, that was an oversight. Okay, that's fine. And yeah, I, I like having trees between the sidewalks and the streets to provide um, barriers for pedestrians and stuff. Like, very good in, in all the levels of detail. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? I have one, uh, Madam Chair, a very simple question. Uh, Deborah Borden, Principal Counsel, is your Exhibit 3 intended to show the actual location of the trees that you're referring to in 1N, or is this illustrative? It's meant to show the actual location of the okay, trees in 1N. We should, we should say that. Okay. In, you know, we, I, I have no we objection can, to that. Yeah, we can add pursuant to or as shown three. in Exhibit 3. in Applicant's Exhibit 3. Exactly. Okay. Thank so you. We'll revise that condition. I have no objection to that. Are there other questions? Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, uh -huh. Mr. Stevens, you'll have the opportunity to come back up. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Frank Stevens from the City of Bowie. Uh, the Bowie City Council conducted a public hearing on this case on April 2nd, 2018, and recommended approval of this DSP uh, pursuant to our letter dated uh, June 21st of last year. Uh, we had two comments in that letter regarding um, lighting, and in speaking with the applicant and uh, Mr. Zhang, uh, those comments will be addressed um, prior to the certification of the DSP. Uh, we imp uh, appreciate working with your staff. Uh, we support the staff recommendation as amended um, for this case, and that concludes the city's presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Okay. Stevens. Were there any questions? Um, was there something you wanted to add? I mean, no, that's, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Okay, was there anyone else who wished to speak on this matter? Mr. Antonetti. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to present this. Uh, just to Mr. Stevens' point, we did add the conditions there in there in applicant's exhibit, um, okay. the last two conditions, so they are carried forward. Okay, thank you. All right, what's the pleasure of the board? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve DSP-18026, AC-18017, and TCP2-036-99-13, along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report 
and is further modified in applicant exhibit number two with the following augment to condition one in we should add uh, and i quote as depicted in applicant exhibit number three. Second. we have a motion and a second is there any discussion all in favor aye, aye. opposed the ayes have it item eight followed by 3d Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Andrew Bishop with the over design section. Item eight is a DSP for infrastructure proposing 205 attached lots and 56 parcels for the future development of a 205 single family attached, for 205 single family attached lots and 44 two family attached dwelling units in the MXT zone. The infrastructure approved with this DSP will establish the layout, landscaping, and general lot configuration for the site. The architecture, I the recreational. I, I thought it was just me, so because the mic seemed to be more sensitive. Yeah, we ha we have to. You have to get a little closer to that mic. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> The architecture, architecture and recreational facilities and signage proposed on the site will be the focus of a future DSP. The site is located in planning area 71B, Council District 4. This site is part of the overall Milford property approved with CSP 06002-01 and is located in the northeastern quadrant of the intersection of MD3 and US 50. The specific limits of this DSP are located on the northern side of Melford Boulevard in the northeastern and northwestern quadrants of, the in, of its intersection with Curry Drive. The property is zoned MXT and the specific area of this DSP is within the central portion of the Melford development on both sides of Curry Drive. The aerial shows the boundary of the DSP outlined in red within the overall Belford subdivision site. The site includes topographic change and stream valleys on site, but no new impacts, is, impacts are to the regulated environmental features are being proposed as further discussed on page 18 of the report. The property is adjacent to the collector roadway of Melford Boulevard to the south. The DSP for infrastructure proposes all site design elements such as the location uh, and design of all of the public and private roadways and alleys and the parcel layout, on-street parking, landscaping, utility locations, fencing, sidewalks, with the exception of buildings. And it is generally designed in a grid patterns with alleys and rear-loaded townhouses fronting on interior green spaces and roadways. The layout of the site plan is consistent with preliminary plan of subdivision 4-16006. These slides show a cross-section of the elevation of the wall surrounding the Melford Historic Home, which was discussed with the alternative compliance application. <coughs> The wall is being planted with additional plant material including upward growing evergreen vines and shrubs on the top of the wall to cascade downward to soften the view of the, the wall and the historic site. Staff believe the proposed plantings are acceptable and are further discussed on page 27 of the report. The Historic Preservation Committee has <coughs> reviewed this application and is recommending approval with no additional conditions. The DSP was evaluated for conformance with the requirements of the Prince George's County Zoning Ordinance, previous approvals, the Prince George's County Landscape Manual, the, la the Woodland and Wildlife Habitat Ordin Ordinance, 
and the tree canopy coverage ordinance and have been found acceptable. The urban design section recommends the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve DSP 18034 alternative compliance AC 18018 and type two tree conservation plan TCP2 Dash zero three six dash nine nine dash one four, subject to the conditions in the staff report and the revised conditions submitted by the applicant, which have been reviewed by staff and we are in agreement with. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions of Mr. Bishop? Mr. Antonetti. <coughs> Good morning again, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the board for the record, Robert Antonetti with the law firm of Ship Lane Horn. He, please be here on behalf of the applicant, St. John Properties, Inc. Um, again, just uh, with me today, I have Mr. Andrew Raud, um, regional partner, Ken Finley, development manager, Steve Zaner, director of landscape and design, and Jen Hearn, development coordinator uh, with St. John Properties. We also have, uh, again, Ms., uh, Mr. Neil Greenberg from Somerset Construction, partner in the Melford Town Center project. And uh, on the Townhouse team, we have uh, Cecily Bidwell with Design Collective, the land planner um, involved with the townhouse layout um, and application that's before you today. And um, last but not least, Mr. Chris Rizzi uh, from Bowler Engineering, landscape architect and uh, civil engineering. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Bishop for his presentation um, and his willingness to work with us um, uh, to review this case and to get it to presentation today. Uh, Again, uh, not to belabor it, this is the Melford Town Center. This is a extension of the residential component of the town center mix, uh, that core that's in the center uh, surrounded by the employment uses that exist. Um, it is uh, ultimately meant to support the layout for 205 townhouses and 44 two over two units, um, the architecture of which will be coming back to you when a builder or builders are identified, and that will be in the form of a detailed site plan, which you'll have the opportunity to review for compliance with all other criteria in the um, conceptual site plan design guidelines as well as the requirements of the MXT zone. Um, the layout that you have before you was reviewed in 2017 as part of the preliminary plan of subdivision. Uh, the street grids, the designation of different streets, private versus public, alleyways, et cetera. Um, so what we are uh, ve uh, very much in, um, uh, in compliance with uh, that preliminary plan of subdivision. This infrastructure does involve the grading, um, the uh, utilities, um, street grid, um, the retaining wall that was identified, uh, and, uh, and some other incidental um, grading activities. Um, I do have an exhibit uh, that, I, that I'd like to uh, place into the record. Um, is this your, oh, is that it? Are you That's my exhibit. To okay. I am really, I'm really falling okay. behind here. So we'll accept that into the record as applicant's exhibit number one. Yes, thank you. Yes, um, it's, the, it's, it's um, directly correlates to the um, PowerPoint, right? It, it, it does. Um, it, with the, yes, the PowerPoint that's up. Um, the first sheet is just uh, basically a rendered plan showing basically the area of where the attached units will be within the Melford um, Town Center. It primarily consists of the southwest and southeast neighborhoods approved in the conceptual site plan. Um, if you look to the next page, um, just going down memory lane, here's some exhibits showing possible perspectives. Um, this, this is basically uh, an exhibit presented with the preliminary plan of subdivision. It shows a view of the units. If you can see the arrows in the upper left-hand corner of your exhibit in, in, in front of you, um, it's, those are the views you're looking at, you know, looking over to the office and employment uses from the edge of the southeast neighborhood. Um, so that's the type of view and streetscape that will be established and is supported by this infrastructure site plan. If you look to the next page, again, it's another view looking directly across, um, showing that uh, the choice of materials, the width of the right-of-way, uh, the presentation of the street trees, et cetera, really um, does allow for a, an appropriate transition. Um, so again, the townhouses and locations were already uh, selected with the preliminary plan, but we thought these exhibits would be a good reminder to show what this, what this infrastructure will support. Um, the next two pages are basically aerial exhibits that were uh, developed uh, with Design Collective and Cecily Bidwell. They were used in part um, with the Historic Preservation Commission presentation, which the HBC reviewed this application. And it just here's some views from the Melford House. Melford House will remain the uh, predominantly high. Uh, it's on the highest point in the entire site. So it will <coughs> remain the dominant um, uh, st uh, structure uh, within the overall project. And this shows what the views might look like. Um, the second page is also a view. Um, 
looking south um, and you know what uh, you know with the foliage and stuff that's uh, already at the Melford at the Melford House site, um, that it will, you know, it'll be a nice transition. The main point of the Melford House really is to keep it as, as the focal point of the project, as opposed for the, as opposed to the development turning its back on it, and making it somewhat of a mausoleum. Uh, we want to encourage adaptive reuse of the Melford House, and uh, that's, uh, we feel that the development and the way we've we've uh, oriented um, these townhouses and this infrastructure and the retail that you've heard the case before really will give it its best chance for survival and reuse in the future. Um, so, again, we just want you to have these exhibits uh, for your perusal and consideration as part of this application. Um, the applicant is in agreement with the staff's recommendation. Um, this application is consistent with all the criteria of approval for the detailed site plan pursuant to the zoning ordinance and all prior conditions of approval. Um, we do have some minor clarification conditions, which we've gone over with staff, which I'd like to hand out and hopefully have entered into the record and marked, please. So we have proposed revised conditions that we will accept into the record as applicants exhibit number two. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, these conditions are clarification conditions um, dealing with some of the details um, shown for the infrastructure plan, including um, the street, uh, I'm sorry, the alley widths being 18 feet and having corresponded updates to the street sections. Um, some uh, issue, um, some details regarding lighting um, and where those lighting fixtures will be located within the alleys and um, some other items dealing with uh, just essentially la labeling and clarification items for uh, the tree conservation plan, um, which are outlined uh, in base of the changes to condition two, that which are shown in light blue. Um, and we believe staff agrees with these uh, condition changes. They, they are all, uh, 205 will be townhomes and there will be 44 two over twos, um, so attached. Um, so this is a two over two? It is not. About the porch. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, an illustrative of a townhome. The townhomes would be in that area looking in that view south across to the employment area. So the townhome will have a porch and a swing? And uh, they, they could. That, does, that architecture will come back in, but you know, we're, we're looking for a high quality experience. Um, no, I get it. It, it's 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 intended to be nice, yes, <laughs> um, and we're we're excited about this. And you want, and not to belabor it, but you know, when we when this was developed, you know, residential was discussed for for many years at Melford, and the city of Bowie had had an intention to uh, move in that direction if we could do something better than residential as as usual. And as you may have recalled, with the Aspen building, that wrap building, and the articulation there, and the architecture there, the amenities there. Um, you know, it, is, it, it isn't just residential as usual, and that's the expectation, and that's the standard we're held to and we're holding ourselves to. So, um, again, the townhouses, when that architecture comes in, may not look exactly like that, but, you know, I think it's evocative of, of what we're trying to achieve um, there. So we look forward to bringing that to you in a future application. So this one is just for infrastructure. You're going to come back with us. That will show the elevation. Yes. I hope the people also don't just look like that because a lot of mm -hmm. we're, we're coming into Afri African American Heritage and Black History Month and a lot of the people in a lot of these renders are just all white. So a little bit of mixture of, of people as well would be good I think just to kind of reflect our diverse community. I think it's you, appropriate given no the month is, that we're going into. No it is but I let it be known already but I was a little more quiet about it. That's okay. That's true. All of, everyone up here uh, kind of observed that there was a lack of uh, diversity if you will. And it was and, just ironic that today we opened up for the Black History Month. And uh, but uh, your, your point's taken and um, certainly um, 
anything shown was, was illustrative and not deliberate. Uh, I'll make, make that clear. But yes, absolutely. Bowie is a diverse community. Um, you know, we embrace the that. We, uh, the, the county is a, a diverse county, and we certainly celebrate that. It's, uh, and the housing opportunities uh, you know, are welcome, and they're, they'll, they'll ref, ref, reflect the fabric of the community in which it's located. So um, in the future, our, certainly our, our illustratives can, can be more on point of that. But So thank you for pointing that out. Yes, ma'am. We are we're in full agreement with the Thank revised you. conditions. Thank you. Okay. And with that, um, that would conclude um, the applicant's presentation. Uh, we thank you for your consideration. If you have any questions, our team is here to answer. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Is there anyone else to speak on this? Uh, uh, Mr. Stevens? Good morning again, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Frank Stevens from the City of Bowie. The City reviewed this application and uh, transmitted its position to the Planning Board in a letter dated June 5th, 2018. Um, we had a couple comments uh, recommending landscape changes, uh, which were incorporated into revised plans that your staff reviewed. We also had two other items that need to be addressed at the appropriate time regarding uh, stormwater management and storm drain and, and paving plans. Uh, in conclusion, we support this application, have no objection to this DSP, and we agree with the staff recommendation. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Okay. Um, was there anyone else to speak? Mr. Antonetti, anything else to add? Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve DSP-18034, AC-18018, and TCP2-036-99-14 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and as further amended by applicant exhibit number two. And thank you, Mr. Antonetti. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? Um, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Mr. Bishop, can you go back to slide one on applicant's exhibit number one? And then we're going to just keep that there. We're going to take two minutes. And then we're coming back and doing 3D. Thank you. It is a presentation. Um, um, do, who's starting this up? Hmm? Uh, okay. no. Thank you. Hello, oh, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> Um, for the record, I'm Brian Barnett Woods with the Transportation Planning Session in the Planning Department, and I'm here today to introduce David Henley from the Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail Organization, which is the project sponsor to the um, Baltimore to Washington Maglev project. Uh, just as a reminder, this project is an MDOT MTA project. It's not a Planning Department project, um, and however, people in our transportation section have been following along with the progress that they have been doing and keeping abreast of what's happening. Um, the Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail is the project sponsor, which is one of the groups that's working on this project with MDOT and MTA. Um, and this is an informational briefing only. Uh, no decision will be made um, regarding anything with the project. It's just to get information and to get status of what's happening with the maglev. Um, if the public does have questions or comments, um, we can accept them, but we recommend that they give those comments to MDOT or MTA, which is on their project website. Um, and I think that's all. With that, I'll introduce uh, David Henley. Uh, now it's on lighter. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Um, David Henley, Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail. Um, as Brian mentioned, I'm here to give you an update on the project. Um, just where the project is right now, as Brian mentioned, this is uh, led by MDOT and MTA, and they're the ones working through the EIS process, and at this point we're entering into the draft EIS segment of the project. And what that means is that we've come to the, uh, uh, the conclusion that we have two alternatives, so we need to get down to one. Uh, we have couple of different station locations in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. We need to make a selection of those. 
we need to finalize where all the support facilities are going to be, including the uh, rolling stock depot. And those will all be part of the DIS deliberative process, and we expect that to be uh, a preferred to be selected mid-year, and there'll be hearings regarding that in the fall, five different hearings this fall. These are the folks that are helping us uh, figure out this project and articulate it in a way that best suits the, the community. Um, so we're working in, in uh, co coordination with all these uh, federal, state, and local entities. Uh, this is the most current schedule uh, where we hope to get the uh, permitting and uh, EIS completed by 2020. Construction could start as early as 2021. Revenue service approximately five to seven years later. And these are the two routes that we're down to. It's basically BW Parkway East and BW Parkway West. And what that means is after uh, the tunneling uh, proceeds from Washington, D.C. to just north of Greenbelt, it will pop up either on the east side of the BW Parkway or the west side and travel for about six to eight miles as a viaduct before it goes back down towards BWI Airport and then it's tunneled from there on uh, into Baltimore. So the right-of-way construction overview, so we're talking 30 miles of deep tunneling. Uh, by any measure, that's probably going to be the largest public works project in the country. Uh, 30 miles of deep tunneling is rather unheard of in terms of the length, uh, but that is the, uh, the uh, alternative that has, the process has led us to. So that's, that's the rules of the game. Um, the tunnel would be 80 to 120 feet deep, passing under residences, churches, schools, other sensitive facilities, which I'll get into in a moment. As I mentioned, six miles of viaduct would be next to several uh, federal facilities and also close to residences in two locations. There will be three stations, one in Washington, D.C., which will be deep underground, one at BWI Airport, again deep underground, and then a possible elevated station in Baltimore, though the decision still hasn't been made and that'll be made uh, by mid this year. And then there'll be a series of uh, support facilities seven fresh air slash emergency egress facilities. That's our new nomenclature. What that is, most people think of it as a vent plant. This ventilation provides fresh air into the system in tunnel segments. But it also, because it serves as emergency access, we're combining it into one term fresh air emergency egress. There'll be four substations. Those are the facilities that provide the power one train set maintenance yard, that's a rail yard, and one maintenance away facility, which is rubber tire, basically a, a parking lot with the, the, the vehicles that through rubber tires travel along the right of way for cleaning and maintenance purposes after the, um, the right of way shut down for service. Um, typical uh, cross sections here, um, a viaduct, which I mentioned is about six miles of the alignment, and then about 30 miles of the alignment would be deep tunnel. Um, you can see below the, on the graphic on the right, uh, there's a scape gallery. When I mentioned emergency access, that's the venue or the, the means for folks to, if there is a fire, to go down to a safe area it's completely ventilated separately than the rest of the system, and they can either wait there or be escorted to the nearest evacuation point. Uh, this is the technology that we will be using to build the deep tunnel. It's called a tunnel boring machine. Um, it's a self-contained unit. Um, it gets launched, that gray box is uh, very deep. That becomes the, the portal for dropping down the machinery for the building of the tunnel. And once the tunnel is completed, that uh, shaft will turn into the clean air evacuation access facility. And they, those are located about every five miles uh, of a tunnel section. What's the proposed location of the, uh, 
launch it? I, I will show you once we okay. get further in. I'm going to show you a map where all the proposed locations are. And so just a little bit more about the machine. It, it is a, it's a little industry in and, of, in and of itself. It's very large. So it has a cutter at the beginning. So that's the digging part. And then it has these uh, uh, conveyor belts that bring the dirt out as it's going forward, delivering it back to the, the opening, the, the tunnel shaft opening I spoke about. And at the same time, it's mounting or uh, casting the concrete segments that form the walls of the, uh, the tunnel. So it's quite an operation, all in one place. And this is nothing new. These are being done every day all over the world, some very sizable. We're mid-sized compared to a lot of other tunnels. Uh, this is a project that's going on right now. The tunneling portion of it has been completed. Um, right through the heart of London. Uh, it's a new uh, uh, tube line and gets within inches of existing tube lines. It's going under historic churches, historic buildings, uh, parliament, et cetera, et cetera, very successfully. Uh, more locally, we have a project, not we, but DC Water has a project for a tunnel boring machine for a new, uh, tunnel, uh, new uh, water uh, system that they have there. Much of it the same thing, deep tunnel, passing under residences, under churches, schools, et cetera. A lot of folks, uh, uh, I'm going to refer now and then to uh, the letter that was sent, which was a very excellent uh, series of commentary and observations about our projects from this board. One of the, uh, the issues that was raised was micro-sediment impacts on residences. Um, all all micro-incidences uh, or that kind of uh, uh, eventuality will be vetted beforehand, but we're not really that concerned. The, the TBM technology is so sophisticated that it can project any kind of movement in advance and and the contractors have to do that on a regular basis. And in fact, for vibration purposes, the entire corridor in which there is tunneling will be monitored with this kind of equipment, which is calibrated to very, very precise levels to, to be able to detect any construction implications in terms of vibration. But since this is going to be about 100 feet below any home or any church or any school, we're not that concerned, but we're going to take the precautions to do this in advance, very collaboratively and proactively in a, in a very proactive uh, uh, public outreach campaign. Okay. So viaduct construct construction is six to nine miles, again, depending on which uh, uh, of the alternatives is selected. It'll be among one of the larger bridge projects in the country. So not only do we have one of the largest tunnel projects, we're going to have one of the largest uh, bridge projects. It'll be a mix of segmental viaduct construction means and methods, meaning precast elements will be transported and then installed in a segmented way. Minimum height will be 18 feet because of the topography. You could be you could be uh, 100 feet up at some points, you know, as we're crossing over roads. Um, we're going to, speaking of roads, we'll be crossing over two major highways. And also, we will be interfacing with BGE's high tension towers. So that's an issue uh, and a challenge. But we're working in close proximity with them. Um, back to the fresh air and emergency egress. Um, one of the locations that was brought up in the letter um, was this particular site, and one of the concerns was traffic, was also view issues uh, in terms of being able to see the facility from the street. This will be a three-story building. It's going to be contained within the confines of WSSC's uh, Kenilworth location which um, I don't think if you're driving by, you're going to be able to see it because of the frontage of their own buildings. It's in a parking lot. Um, we're working very cooperatively with them, um, and I think it's a, it's a good news story here. 
Uh, this one is a little bit more challenging um, uh, off of 410. As you see, that purple line on the left is already a project under construction, the purple line. Uh, expect their, their construction will be over be, be, before our starts. Uh, they are put in a maintenance yard, just the, uh, the southern end of this uh, picture. You can't see it. Um, this particular area is near residences, which always is a factor when you're constructing because the, the implications of construction uh, is, a, is a, not a popular issue. A construction project is not a popular neighbor. So we're going to be working very closely with uh, the uh, local uh, planning board or planning uh, folks that give uh, the, the, the durations of the work and the amount of uh, uh, vehicles that are allowed, et cetera, et cetera, and set the maintenance protection of traffic, the routes for the delivery of all that. Uh, we'll be working very closely. Um, in terms of noise, um, this is really just applicable to the, the elevated sections. Um, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned, there is a proximity to a couple of different neighborhoods, um, very close in fact, within 100 feet of a, a few homes. Um, there is no uh, particular train-like noise because we're not on steel wheels. We don't have steel tracks, so none of that squealing noise. Um, but what it's replaced by is um, a system that is the, the is, is a, it's an elevated train. It's about four inches above the ground, and it's powered by magnets, so there's no sound in that regard. Train operation, there's no sound. But as it's whizzing by, there is an air displacement noise, which I think if you're very close, that could be an issue. Um, so we'll have to work with the local community. There are different mechanisms we've developed that will mask that noise and contain that noise. Just remember that the location that we're talking about is alongside the BW Parkway, so it's already a noisy neighbor at that point. But we'll work with folks to figure out um, the best way to do it. And there are things like hooded structures, um, there's sound barriers which can be mounted on the side walls up high to mask the localized sound. And we think between these two, um, we can figure it out. Uh, some of the benefits of the jobs, uh, jobs, I mean, uh, the, the, this is a job it's a, it's a, you're talking about it being a huge uh, public works project, then you're talking a lot of jobs and for a long time. And it has not only localized implications, but nationwide implications. And speaking of jobs, we're looking, we've already uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with the NABDU, the building trades group for union jobs. Um, they're going to help us develop skilled labor, localize skilled labor, not only Prince George's County, Anne Arundel County, Baltimore City, et cetera. So we're very, we're very happy about that collaboration. It'll be different kinds of jobs, uh, from construction, which is, as we know, short term, but then there's engineering, maintenance, the actual operation of the stations and the system itself and the management of facilities are all opportunities. A uh, little bit more back on vibration. Uh, again, uh, the vibration from the operation is going to be insignificant. Uh, whatever vibration we're going to monitor during construction. EMF is well below World Health Organization standards, so we'll be very uh, confident about that. So again, with all the folks not uh, traveling in their cars, there's going to be less air pollution. That's a good thing. We think about 50% of our ridership is going to be uh, conveyed the, uh, getting out of their car and getting onto the train. So in terms of summing up, um, we think we have the technology. The technology has been developed, is in place, has been proven, is certified, safe, and in operation in Japan. The deep construction methods that we're using are used all over the world, been successfully done in cities all over the world, including New York, as I mentioned, London. 
This is a process that's driven by agency coordination. I showed you the list and through public engagement. Uh, we'll be having public hearings later on. Uh, but this is the kind of dialogue that we can have at any time, me here or me with the planning staff, which I've done before. Uh, so the next steps, as I mentioned, is to select a preferred REIT, a preferred route and station locations, which will be mid-year but discussed in the fall, five corridor wide public hearings, and then record of decision mid-2020. I think that's it. It's wonderful. Do you have, can you, how, how fast will it get from D.C. to Baltimore? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen. Yeah, with a stop at BWI. I bring the train in Japan. I mean, I'm just so excited that it's coming to this area. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, yeah and the, the challenge is, it, the challenge isn't so much it bringing the technology here because the technology is already in place. We, we need to translate it into federal railroad administration guidelines because right. they're the ones that have purview over all rail operations. So we've got to work out that translation. But the more important thing in terms of making this successful and why it's successful in Japan is their culture of yes. discipline, of meeting t schedule, on-time performances with, mm -hmm. within 20 seconds mm -hmm. of, its, of, its, of its schedule. So getting that translated is going to be the biggest challenge, I think. And they deliver on it, too. It's, yeah. I'm just excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So who, the, who ultimately decides the location of the uh, stations and uh, the route? Yeah. Uh, ultimately, it's the Federal Railroad Administration. Okay. But uh, I pointed out that one slide that showed 30 different agencies. Mm -hmm. they, they work it through a very collaborative process. So all of those agencies with their particular jurisdiction have a say-so. At some point, though, pencils down and it's the FRA. With, with the last presentation we have, uh, I, we made a comment, at least I did, I was wondering why it would not be short-sighted by not have, having it start in Prince George's County by, let's say, by National Harbor and then going straight through the city. That's interesting. I, I New Carrollton jumps to mind. I, That's another one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's the dynamic of the federal, uh, the FRA developed a maglev deployment program and they, they developed it in the 90s and looked at different regions around the country. The Baltimore, Washington uh, uh, segment is the one that floated up every time. Now separately and apart from that, the Japanese had just developed this SE maglev and were looking for another location to deploy it between Tokyo and Osaka is the number one busiest rail corridor in the world. I, I, like Commissioner Washington, and, I've been on And that. number two is the Northeast Corridor. But it was the wow. Baltimore-Washington segment that we, we uh, competed for. So that becomes the, the dynamic of that sets into place the EIS is predicated on that route, not adding in or starting at a different location. Because of the decision that was made how long ago? Well, 2015 is That's when the okay. offering was made, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. But the Baltimore-Washington uh, corridor, as a corridor, was looked at for two decades. Okay. And in fact, uh, in 2003, the FRA had another maglev project, a much earlier version than the one we have, not quite as fast. And they took it all the way up through the EIS, the final EIS, but it was very unpopular because it was at grade. Okay. And hugely impactful to localities. So the FRA wasn't gonna shove something down, uh, something that unpopular down people's throats, so they just didn't I issue a record of decision. Right. Comment and question. Um, I'm actually fascinated by the tunnel boring. I remember following the London stuff a whole lot, and that was just super cool. Um, so I'm excited to see this come up. 
especially for the time savings. Um, two kind of questions on it. One is just based on like recent experiences. This might be somewhat of a stupid question for like an engineering for me to post an engineering person, but because of all the snows we've had recently, yeah, um, is that going to cause a safety kind of concern for people who are around there when you have extremely high platforms of snows being pushed off, or how are you going to dispose of it? Yeah, that's that's a uh, that's a good question. It's not a stupid question. By the way, I'm not an engineer. Um, Japan has been grappling with this because their their uh, alignment, which is they're building out the 475 right now, and it's going through the Japanese Alps. Yeah, right so uh, right probably 80% of their viaduct is in tunnel, just like ours is, but that 20% that isn't is subject to prevailing uh, weather. So what they've chosen to do is to put a hood over the exposed areas. Okay. Uh, now they get a lot more snow than we do. Um, that's something they're strongly recommending to us to do, not just for weather, but there's transponders within the right of way that would be protected mm -hmm. and would become less of a maintenance issue if they were protected. So that's probably the way we're gonna go in terms of snow prevention. We can plow, you know, there are, there are plowing mechanisms that, are, that can be safely brought onto the right of way. There's no equipment on the right of way, it's just the, magnets that are embedded in the sides of the, uh, the uh, guideway uh, so it's not like a conflict but where you where you deposit it you know how that works has to be worked out it may be a combination I would like to have some open sections because quite frankly I want people to see this um, I want people that are writing it to be able to see out um, but we may be limited to that by virtue of weather conditions and safety Sort of following up on that, if, if you have icicles that begin to develop off of platforms that are 100 feet up, like how are you going to prevent those from falling um, down on cars or people that might be in the near vicinity if they're right. and stuff? Right. The, the viaduct section that would be 100 uh, feet high is not in a populated area and there's no platform. It's not a station, so there's no reason to stop. Um, but we will take protective measures, you know, any structure has to have a protocol and an operating procedure that deals with any extremity, including ice accumulation or snowfall, et cetera, et cetera. And the areas below will be fenced off, um, so it's not as if um, you know anybody walking by is going to be able to go under that and face that uh, eventuality. So. Okay, and then the other. Um, so I will comment. I, I love the timeliness of of these trains, because we don't always have timely trains in the northeast quarter around here. I've been delayed a number of times going to the city and going down to Richmond and stuff, and it's it's extremely frustrating when you have meetings to get to. Um, so having the timeliness will yeah. be great. Um, a concern that we have raised, though, in the past is um, the potential, and, and it's sort of a difficult situation because this is a, a public-private partnership, but the potential for them to be different types of riders. Um, so you're going to be catering to the more fluent riders who can subsidize, who, who can afford to go this this way, and they're, they're going to want to save the mm -hmm. time. So mm -hmm. I understand the economics yeah. around it. That if I have a meeting, I need to get to it in New York, right. and I want to come back, then then I can go from right. here to New York quite quickly. Um, but is there going to be any thoughts to subsidies for lower income individuals, or seniors, or vets, or any other kind of? Um, we want to have that right? conversation. Uh, just so you know, it will be dynamic pricing, just okay. like uh, just like Amtrak. Yep. Um, I take Amtrak to New York to DC frequently. If I know in advance, right. um, the ticket's like half the price. Yeah, it's okay, like it's that away. it's that trip where it's like, oops, you got a trip today. Yeah. You're paying, <laughs> you know, high yeah. price, and oh, yeah. if you pay, if you pay for a seller. It's 400 bucks to go yeah. to New York from Washington D.C. If you if you buy it in advance, it's you know 49. savings of 300, you know whatever. So, but yes, um, like to have that conversation. I would okay. welcome that. I think that's that's an exceptional issue that a lot of us are attuned to here in mm -hmm. our county. Mm -hmm. um, that we we've, we've been kind of grappling with and having that kind of conversation, I think, would be helpful. Right. Um, going forward. And even just the workforce between the two yeah. cities, that's huge. Is there yeah. a lot of commuters, Baltimore, D.C.? Between. Yeah, mm -hmm. vice versa. Yeah. So. 
When, when we were supposed to have a presentation also from the Maryland Department of Transportation, um, who's working with the federal government, of course, so since this, there's a shutdown, then they weren't able to have the presentation, give us the presentation. So um, when that happens, um, one of the things that we have talked about before is also, I mean, while the, the notion is intriguing, there's a, there are a lot of considerations, and that you all you received in the letter. Um, yes. The, from, from the board, the board did not take a position against it, but we had an extensive briefing in October, and we expressed concerns, and um, and and we wanted to see where, how these concerns were being addressed. And one of the concerns, among many, um, or among several, was the impact to the homes, the property owners, mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. who have been living in these communities yeah, yeah. For, for a long period of time. And I know, I guess when MDOT comes, um, I, I've talked with our experts, and, and um, when MDOT does come, um, which I guess has been rescheduled, hoping that they can It was next with the, Thursday, I think, but it got... Uh, it was because yeah. but they are, they have to communicate with the federal government, yeah. and, the, and they have been able to do that, so therefore they had to cancel. So... Um, um, when they do come, and I'm, I, one of the things that we'd like to hear are proposed routes or what, you know, and, and I know it's not um, etched in stone, but what areas we're looking at. Uh, um, I mean, I, where I live, I see a lot of stop the maglev signs, and, um, and, and people are concerned. Yes. And it's not that this isn't a, a wonderful um, innovation, because I, I believe it is, but, you know, there are other things that have to be addressed. I understand that, and when we have that meeting, because I was invited to that okay. meeting as well, um, we can. I have the responses here. Okay. I was but trying to filter have... them into the presentation yes, as I did. went along, but but we can have a more targeted discussion and just go through the letter and and have a, a, a more dynamic conversation. Madam Vice Chair. Uh, next steps, poll five um, public hearings. Who is the target audience for that public, those public hearings, and uh, uh, when do you anticipate that kind of action occurring? It will be in October, and again, this is going to be MDOT and MTA that are facilitating that. There will be one, there always are, uh, one in Washington, D.C., and then one in Baltimore, and then three somewhere in the study area. I'm going to say perhaps one in Anne Arundel County and then two in Prince George's County. I don't have any don't have right any. to be saying that, but it just sort of makes sense that it would be split up that way. Uh, that's the way it has been split up before. So possibly one in Anne Arundel County, possibly two in Prince George's County. You don't know that for sure, but can you say with some certainty that there will be at least be one in Prince George's oh, County? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Okay. At minimum one, and, okay. and hopefully two. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, does the board have any other questions? What about our transportation folks? Do you, is there something that that you would like to ask that we haven't asked? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Thank so you. Thank you, and I look forward to meeting with you again shortly to go over more detail the uh, and comments. So, and you will be here when we have the MDOT presentation, MDOT. which will be posted so that everyone will have an opportunity, because we have interested citizens as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, so Sorry. Plan and board is in recess until 1.15. Thank you. So good afternoon. The Prince George's County Plan and Board is back in session. Um, 
This morning we um, went into closed session pursuant to section 3-305 B1, B3, and B7 of the general provisions article of the annotated code of Maryland for purposes of discussing a land purchase, a consultation with council on a proposed stormwater management property easement, and to confer with council on a legal services matter and a personnel matter. We did not conclude before it was time to start our development review items and therefore we're going to continue our closed session um, uh, pursuant to the uh, provisions I just cited in the general provisions article. So move to continue the closed session, Madam Chair. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. We need a motion to come out of closed session. So move. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. We need is a motion to ratify the action taken in closed session. So move. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Is there any additional business to come before the planning board today? No, hearing, hearing none, planning board is adjourned.